Terry Pomeranian, thank you so much for being our guest uh, once again. No, you're welcome. I get asked quite a bit, you know, with different interviews, whether it be on television or radio or or even just in conversation with people when they find out what I do, uh, they always say kind of inevitably, what's the what's the most wildest case you've ever seen? You know, what's the most haunted story you can tell me? And without a doubt, as I tell everybody, the Pomeranian farmhouse, that story, your childhood home has to be the most incredible story in paranormal history. And that's a bold statement for anybody to make, but I believe that a hundred percent. So I know there's so much to cover, you know, and I saw you looking at this book earlier, police reports. I mean, right. right here alone, we could go on for weeks. Right. For those that haven't seen the documentary and the investigation that we did, A Haunting on Dice Road, The Hell House, which, of course, they can stream on Amazon Prime and different outlets, start at the beginning. Well, my mom and dad, they uh, got married in 1951, and they had the house built uh, before they got married. And uh, then they got married and moved into it. They had lived there about uh, well, 22 years and it was never, no problems. It was a nice little house, small, cozy house, just, you know, perfect for our family. And uh, one night, all hell started breaking loose. Now, you know, before we get get into that. Okay. You know, what What really surprises me is a lot of people, you know, they, they have that impression that for a house to be haunted, it must be an old, old house from the 1800s or the 1700s, and people must have died there, and, and, and that's the recipe for a haunting. But this is so extraordinary in the sense that your family built the house. Yeah, 1953. Yeah, no prior residence. No, no one ever, died. Right, nothing. And and what's also interesting, too, is the land that the house was built on was right next to your grandparents. Right. And, and they gave them that property right. to kind of keep it in the family. Right. Okay, so that was kind of a homestead, if you would, the Pomeranian yeah, homestead. for years and years and years, yeah. Yeah, we've seen maps going back to the 1800s. Right. And it was in the Pomeranian name. So. Right. So they get married, they, they have this brand new house that they built. Right. They lived there for over 20 years. Yep, 23 years. Nothing. Nothing, nothing out of the ordinary, nothing strange. For reference, this was in the, the village of Merrill, Michigan, Correct. Uh, Saginaw County. Yes. On uh, Dice Road in Chapin. Yes. Okay, so, you know, I guess we got to get right into it. I know it's a little bit difficult for you to talk about to some degree uh, some of these elements but what was that first moment you know when did it when did everything change and, and, and give us the detail of what happened that night well it happened july 9th of 1974 all four of our family members we all went to bed that night all pretty much the same time uh you know maybe by midnight we were all in bed about two o'clock that morning, we all got woke up. We heard this loud noise, like glass breaking. And uh, it sounded like it came from the kitchen area. And we went out in the kitchen. We seen our, our kitchen window was uh, busted. So me and my father, Harold, we went outside, see if we'd see anybody yet. And it was just a few minutes after it we had heard the noise. We went right outside too then and didn't see nothing. So we called the uh, Sinal County Sheriff's Department and they sent the Sinal County Sheriff's Department out and, you know, they just took the report then and that was pretty much it. So, I mean, we figured, you know, had to be someone definitely that was out there and did that. Just, uh, I we didn't know if they were just... Uh, was just kids or messing around or or what but uh, it just seemed funny because at the time I was uh, worked at a blueberry farm just a couple of miles from our house and I just thought maybe it was some kids that had asked for a job and I didn't hire them and maybe they were upset at me about that that's what I thought at first but but then the next night, after it got dark, we just had a bunch of pounding on the, like the east side of our house, around by the window areas. It was just like 
someone was out there on the, on the side of the house, like I said, and just using their fist, just, you know, pounding like as hard as they could. The sheriff's department came out for the second night in a row, and they looked for footprints and that, and they could even uh, find any footprints, even in the grass with the grass being a little wet. So they were starting to already just after the second night was they didn't know really what the hang was going on, you know? Yeah. On Dice Road, that mile on Dice Road that we lived on uh, between Chapin and uh, Steel Road, it was just our house, my parents' house, and uh, uh, one neighbor uh, that lived east on Dice, about maybe a half mile down. Those were the only two homes on the whole mile. Okay. Yeah, so just kind of giving context to the people that are watching and listening, when you, if you were to look out your windows, I mean, you can see quite far. What's going through your guys' head at this point? I mean. Well, I mean, we just still thought that it had to be someone coming around, you know, just wanting to mess with us, keep us, keep us awake all night, you know. And I just still had my head that I must have made some young teenager that wanted a job real bad for the summer that I must have really got him upset because I didn't hire him at the blueberry farm. That's what I kept thinking. And at that time, the, the, the occupants of the house, it was yourself and your brother, Dwayne. Correct. And your father, Harold, and your mother, Mabel. Right. And so how old were you at this at this time? Yeah, Steve, I was 19. My 19? Br- my brother was 21. 21. And then Harold and Mabel? They were like in their early 50s. Early 50s? Yeah. Okay. So did your parents kind of vocalize that? That opinion that they thought maybe it was teenagers in the area goofing around, or you know, did, did did they have any ideas of what could be causing this? They they thought too that maybe I was right, you know, that maybe it was one of the neighbor kids. That I sort of had one in mind at the time that was a little upset with me that that I did not hire him. Okay, and I just sort of thought you know possibility it could be him and my parents sort of thought that way too for a while because they they knew how that kid could be where, where does it go from here now this is two nights in a row you know it's the the first night this happens with the with the window breaking second night now you've got pounding on the side of the house right police come again what happens on the third night same thing you know it was every night it would happen maybe started uh the knock in um, maybe an hour, maybe two after it got dark, and we would, you know, we'd be either just going to bed and, or we'd be still up watching TV thinking, well, now is it going to happen tonight again? You know, it's going to be three nights in a row, or, or did they have their fun, you know, for a couple of nights, and maybe that's it? We didn't know what to think that third night, but uh, I think my ma had went to bed Maybe got an hour's sleep before it started in on the third night. Sure enough, started knocking again. And always, uh, that was uh, the second night in a row where it was the knocking, pounding on the east side of the house. Yeah, well, it would, you know, it, it would, uh, it'd be like a couple, two, three hard knocks away, at, you know, on, on, the, on the frame of the window. And then, you know, we'd look out right away again. And again, we didn't see nothing. We just thought, well, maybe they uh, they figure that we're looking out our bedroom windows, the east windows. And yeah, because both, both bedrooms in the home were right on the east side. Right. So, I mean, it would have been right there. So what window do you think it was pounding on? The, the bathroom window in between the two bedrooms or one of the bedrooms? Well, it was mainly the first two times the first two nights it was mainly on uh me and my brother's uh bedroom east window and did you guys call the police the third time (laughs) yep i mean we called them again and they came out again and and uh like i say nothing again you know they they just didn't know what to think either just after you know three nights in a row they just i don't know what they thought they but I think they were already getting disgusted, you know. You know, we're coming out, they're calling us every night out here, and uh, there's nothing, you know. They're saying there's a pound on the outside, but we don't see any footprints or anything, and 
you know, I'm kind of, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. You know, they're coming out there and, and they're realizing, okay, you know, they're looking up your, your address and doing what police do when they respond to a call and they show up and they've never had calls from you guys in the past. Never. No. You know, they've never had to come out to your house, never had a problem. No, we never, I mean, our family was, we're just such a loving family. You know, my parents always got along, never, they never argued, never fought, never had any family problems. So yeah, there was, there was never any police ever called out there. I mean, my grandparents had lived there all their lives, and they would never even lock their doors when they'd uh, go away. So now it's three nights into it, and you're saying that this happened night after night after night after night. Yeah, for the uh, from the first night for six months straight. Every six night, six months. Every night after it got dark, for six months straight. Finally, my dad was getting ready for work one afternoon because he worked second shift. He was in the bathroom, and the pounding started like at about two o'clock in the afternoon, right on the bathroom uh, outside the bathroom window. Broad daylight. Yep, broad daylight. My dad said, "Oh my God, now it's going to start." Starting the daytime too, and he looked right out the bathroom window. I mean. He was only a couple feet from the, he was standing by the sink there in the bathroom and just had to walk a couple feet over and look out and there was, there was nothing. We didn't know what to think. We said, oh my God, now it's, now it's going to start in the day, just like my dad said. And then it, it didn't matter. Then after that, it was pretty much going 24 hours a day. Literally just yeah. day, night, evening. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, you know, when you say six months, I would think that you guys were trying anything you could to catch them. I mean, oh, yeah. you setting me, up different traps, so to speak. Me or, and my dad and the one neighbor guy, he even helped us, or he said, I'm going to try and help you guys catch this person, whoever's doing this. And so the three of us would, right bef- after it got dark, we would go, and by that time when we started doing that, the soybeans would gotten taller but enough to where we could lay uh in the field in between the rows of the soybeans and uh we figured well the first time we did it you know we're going to catch us whoever's doing it tonight you know we would go out there well in the summertime it doesn't really get dark till 10 o'clock in the evening so we went out there we'd probably get out there by about quarter after 10 the times that we did do that and we'd lay out there some nights. We laid out there till four o'clock in the morning. No one ever, you know, came up to the house and started knocking because if they would have, we would have, we would have definitely caught them. So we'd say, "Well, shoot, might as well go in." And they're, I guess they're not coming around tonight. It'll be the first time that they have it then. So we'd see our neighbor walk in his house and. Me and my dad would uh, get in the house and uh, weren't even in bed yet. At maybe five minutes after we got uh, back inside the house and uh, and uh, the knocking started. And we'd say, oh my, you got to be kidding me. Whoever must he was, whoever was must be doing this was already, they seen us when we first went out there last night. And they they waited us out, and then they seen us, you know, come in the house and gave them uh, gave us about five minutes to get, get settled in, maybe going to bed, and uh, and then they started pounding away. Okay, now speaking of of neighbors, at some point you have a, a really interesting visit from from a woman who came to your property. Uh, can you can you tell us that story and, and, and what words were exchanged? Sure. Yeah, we had new neighbors moved in that summer of 74. Um, they moved in like about the middle of June of that year. And um, me and my dad and my mom were out in our backyard one evening. And the new neighbors, we seen them come and walk across the Chapin Road, went actually through the ditch and walked through our field and then uh, came up to us, introduced themselves that, you know, they were our new neighbors and and seemed like real nice people, you know, and uh, 
But then about five minutes after we had just first met him, uh, the neighbor lady, the new neighbor lady, looked at my dad and just out of the blue said, would you like to sell your house? My dad like looked at her like, sell our house? And she said, yeah, would you like to sell your house? My dad said, well, no, but, you know, why are you asking that, you know? And she would not answer my dad, give him no reason really why she said that. It was maybe a month or month and a half after they moved in there, me and my parents, mainly, we started noticing a few strange things that they would uh that they would do, especially uh, the the lady. I mean, she'd go outside, go in their backyard, and she would do all kinds of weird things with her hands and arms. She'd just throw her hands and throw her arms up in the air. And once, I'll, I'll never forget, because country people usually burn their trash in a trash container or trash barrel. She would go out there, and it could be downpouring rain, just tremendous thunderstorm, and she would be able to start the, their garbage and burn it. And, shoot, if I'd tried that, doing that, and no way in hang I ever could get, get it, uh, the fire going to burn the bag up with the trash in it. But she had no problem doing it. She she did that several times, and and we'd we'd watch her and see that, and we'd think, man, how in the hang, how, how is that? You know, how she, how she, how can she make you know that uh, garbage burn and nobody else can? So they, they just really to me really seemed strange for one thing, and like I say, all the different things how she did with her arms and hands and would look up in the sky and just, I don't know, it was just seemed like something was very strange and not right with, uh, especially with her. Then after, I guess I'm going a little bit ahead of myself here, but I truly believe that there was witchcraft because a lot of people out in Merrill then came back and told our family that, that the neighbor lady uh, would go out to the Merrill drugstore with their uh, five-year-old daughter, and they would always buy witchcraft books. And plus, what really struck me, though, was the first night that we met them, you know, I asked them where they moved from, and they told me. And then she said, uh, well, I hope this is going to be our last stop because I'm, I'm tired of moving all the time. This will be our 10th move in the last 12 years. And I said, wow, I guess. I said, to move that many times in 12 years? And she said, yeah. And then she said again, I hope this is going to be our last stop. So buying books on witchcraft, and then you're seeing her outside, and she's doing strange movements with her hands, and and being out at a burning barrel in the middle of a thunderstorm with pouring rain. Oh, yeah. I mean, number one, that's pretty dangerous because obviously these barrels would be made out of some type of metal and you're out in the field in a thunderstorm. That's pretty bizarre. Right. Needless to say. Right. And plus, as you said, you know, the trash burning and being engulfed and that's pretty odd behavior. Right. I mean, it would be, Steve, it would be raining so hard. I mean, the bag, the trash had have been all wet, you know, just a few minutes after she put it in there. You know, with Merrill being such a small community, I'm assuming the town was talking. It sounds like at that point about this new this new couple, this new family that moves in. Yeah, because everybody knew knows everybody in a small community like that. They'd always ask my parents, you know, well, how's things going out at the house? Is it getting any better? Or, so, that, you know, they talked. They knew, you know, that we were having some major problems out there and, and nobody really knew what was what was causing it or what was going on. She supposedly told our one other neighbor, Vicki, that she was a ordained witch. She did tell Vicki that. So it was getting around big time out in Merrill then that, uh, that maybe it was the neighbor that was uh, causing these problems in the Pomeranian home. And you guys never had any problems until they moved into the neighborhood. Correct, right. And then once they move in, 
they, about a month later. About a month later. And this is right shortly after they asked to buy your property and right. you guys refused the right. not interested. Right. That's pretty interesting in itself. Six months continuously, this pounding is happening. Now, are you guys continuing to call the police as well? Every night. Every night the police. They came out them. every night. I mean, every night. Even uh, the one captain from the sheriff's department, him and his wife and two teenage daughters came out one night. And uh, and at first, about the first hour or so that they were there, nothing happened. But then his wife had to use the bathroom and... While she was in the bathroom, the knocking started right on the bathroom, outside the bathroom uh, window, and she just came running out of the bathroom and back into the living room where we were all sitting, and she was as white as a ghost. She, I mean, I can still see her to this day how white she was. She just was so scared. After that happened, then there was other things, uh, a lot more knocking happened that night. So... Terry, you know, I want to stop you there just for a, for a moment because people that are watching and listening uh, to what we're what we're talking about here, they're right. probably trying to figure out, well, why would the captain of the sheriff's department be there with his his wife and his children? I mean, why is that? I mean, did it, it got to the point where they would come out so frequently that you guys kind of built some type of relationship? Or? Well, he had called my dad that morning, the night that they did come out. And he had said to my dad that himself and his wife and two daughters would like to come out that night and just see if anything would happen while they were there. Well, we didn't realize that they were going to have a, the Sino County Sheriff's Department had planned a stakeout. They had like about eight sheriff de, uh, deputies surrounding outside of our house, all four directions that that evening, our family, we didn't know that. Uh, the captain said, if if you have anything happen before we get there, you know, just call 911. My ma and my brother were doing up supper dishes, and I had just came out of the bathroom and went into my bedroom to get a new shirt to put on, and the knocking started right on the outside of our, me and my brother's bedroom window again so my mom said i'll oh, be darn you're starting up already and uh so she called 911 and and dispatch then got a hold of uh the guy that was in charge of the stakeout and said well we just got a call from the pomeranian from miss mrs pomeranian and said that there's knocking on the east side of the house they said you know they had their walkie talkies and they they just checked with everybody and said, you see anybody? Did you see anybody? And they all said, no, we didn't see nothing. It was probably about 10 minutes later then captain, the captain and his wife and two daughters showed up, and he talked with the deputies that were on the stakeout, and a couple of them got into my mom's face and got my mom very upset that night saying, one of your sons has got to be doing this. Because there's no no there was no one out here, you know. We had your whole house surrounded, and we didn't see nobody. And I mean, a couple of them got really, really, actually mean to my ma, and had my ma actually crying really, especially after the one said, "It's got to be one of your sons that's doing this. You're probably just pounding from the inside of the house, you know, on the walls." So then the captain told the eight deputies to leave, that you know him and his wife and two daughters were going to stay out here now for a little bit and see if anything else happened. It was probably a good hour, hour and a half before his wife went to use the restroom, and and then that's when the pounding started right uh, on the bathroom window when she was in there. And uh, and after that happened, then it was quite a bit of, pounding uh the rest of the night while they were there and so the captain i mean obviously this is a this is a captain of a of the sheriff's department right so he's going to be making sure that he's got all eyes on on both of the kids you and your brother Dwayne, and right and the rest of the family so now he's experiencing this right and can't come up with a solution right there was a couple times that night steve when i know like my brother had to use 
bathroom too and and there was knocking then like when he was in there too before they left that night the captain took my mom off the side and and said that uh he would like for my dad and my mom to uh come down to his office in the morning that he wanted to talk with both of them they went down there and talked to him and and uh, i came home from work that uh, about noon that day for lunch and uh, my dad and mom were standing in the kitchen entranceway leading out to the utility room and I opened up the utility room door and came in and and uh, first thing that came out of my dad's mouth was well I said when did you guys get home and he said oh, about a half an hour ago and I said well what do you what do you have to say and my dad said well they got they think they got a suspect and I said, really? And I said, who? And my dad looked at me and he said, you. They think that maybe you're you're doing this all. And I said, you got to be kidding me. So my dad said they're going to, within the next week, they're going to come out one morning and a uh, sheriff deputy is going to pick you up and take you uh, to the sheriff's department in Saginaw. And then from there, um, the captain's going to take you to the state police post in Bay City, Michigan, and for a lie detector test. So it was a, it was the very next morning they did it right away then. And they took me there to Bay City, and they gave me the lie detector test like a couple different times, and I was there like for about four hours, and, and they said that I passed it with flying colors. That They said they know Terry... Terry's not doing this. So then they were really stumped then. They they did not know what to what to do then or what to think. And as a matter of fact, I, I have that report here on this binder. I have several reports in here, of course, referencing the documentary again, A Haunting on Dice Road. Uh, for those that have already seen the film, they already know this story. But in this folder is actually your the conclusion of your polygraph. And it states right on the paperwork here that you passed with flying colors. Right. That they had done the tests you actually several times in different ways, asking right. you the same question. Real tricky questions right. they did, yeah. And that they could find absolutely no pattern of deceit right. or no untruthful answers. Right, no. So at that moment, I mean, backing up just a little bit, I mean, what went through your mind when your dad says, yeah, you know, there is a suspect, it's you? I mean, what, how, you know, how did that feel knowing that you're not the person that's doing this? Well, but then, you know, I sort of thought, well, I guess I can sort of see the police maybe thinking that now because, you know, like the night before, I had just came out of the bathroom, went into my bedroom to get a clean shirt from the closet, and then the knocking was, you know, right on that in that area. And I said, you know, I, I guess I can sort of see maybe why they they might be thinking that, that, you know, that could be me then. What was their reaction? I mean, when, when they realized that you passed this polygraph and they, they knew that you weren't a suspect and they had to eliminate you from it, did they, did, did their demeanor change or how, how were they reacting and how were they treating you? Well, I mean, they still were coming out every night and just getting more discouraged every night that they came out because it was just the same old thing all the time, you know. It was, well, Pomeranians are calling again. They got knocking out there again tonight, and we're going to go all that ways out there, and we're not going to find nothing. It's yeah. going to be the same old thing. But they, they came out, though. I mean, they came out every night. And it didn't stop there uh, because not only were you polygraphed, but then your brother was polygraphed. And even your parents. I mean, can you can you tell us about that as well? Well, uh, yeah, it was. I don't know how long after they did theirs. After you know, I had done mine first, but but they they all passed theirs too, and so they just the police then did not know what to think or what to do, and so now everyone's been eliminated as a suspect in your family. Right, everyone's been polygraphed. Everybody passes the polygraph. Right. So, of course, now it's they're probably a little more stumped trying to figure out, okay, well, who's actually causing this? And if this wasn't all confusing enough between the pounding and, 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 and polygraphs and stakeouts, now the activity reaches another level, and it goes from pounding to explosions. Yep, explosions, yep. 
Now, it what, was like the one police officer or sheriff deputy he thought it was like a certain amount of TNT went off, he thought, the one blast, because he had been in the service, and uh, he said it was like, I can't remember how he, exactly how he stated, but it was like a certain amount of TNT, the explosion was. That's how bad it was. It cracked the ceiling. One night they told us pretty much evacuate the house because they thought the ceiling in the kitchen was going to come down. It was it cracked the whole middle of the the ceiling in the kitchen part, and they said you guys better better get out of there the way you're having these big old explosions tonight. Now, but, did did they witness these explosions? Did the police witness these explosions? Yes, the one sheriff deputy he got so involved in it. I mean, even on his days off from the sheriff's department, he would act, he would come out to our place and and be with us most of the day or most of the night on his days off. And one day he was there and we were all standing in, in the kitchen and he was standing up next to the uh, refrigerator and he had like his hand and arm leaning on the side of the refrigerator. And all of a sudden this real big explosion or blast happened. The refrigerator literally raised right up from that explosion, probably a good foot, foot and a half off the floor. And that sheriff deputy, he got hurt from it, from that blast or explosion. He was off work for a long time then. He had real severe back problems from that. And that's when he said it was like a certain amount of TNT had wet off. I mean, that deputy could not believe it. And he was in... A lot of pain, and like I say, he he was off work for for quite some time then too. Now, I mean, when you say explosions, I mean we're you, you know, I mean, I, I know this story, of course. You know, at, at length, I've researched this case for right. about four years now. Right. But for people that are watching right now and listening that are not familiar with the Haunting on Dice Road documentary, what could have been causing them? I mean, and how often was it happening? Was there one part of the house that seemed to happen most? Well, the big blasts or explosions did seem like they happened most mostly in the dinette and kitchen area of the of the house because, like I say, the refrigerator came up off the floor and the ceiling was you know cracked so all the way across in the kitchen dinette area. So it was it was mainly there, and that would be the center of the house. Yeah, right? and. Uh, then the uh, state police, Michigan State Police, got involved too. They brought out like fifteen thousand dollars worth of equipment, and, and this is in nineteen seventy five, right? So you know, fifteen thousand dollars back then, it's pretty pretty pricey equipment. I'm seismographs, I'm assuming things of that nature, right? And they said that they would, with the equipment they had out there, that they would be able to pick up where this was coming from, or what was causing it. And they had all the equipment sitting in our kitchen, on the kitchen table. I think it was for two weeks, I believe. During that time, Steve, we only had like, for that two-week period, and before that, I mean, we were getting these blasts and explosions every day, maybe three, four, or five times a day, real bad. We even had... Uh, uh, two state tro uh, troopers stayed with us 24-7 for a two-week period. And uh, and they heard and seen a lot of things. And I can still see the one state trooper. He was a big big guy, too. He was about 6'5", I'd say probably about 260. And I know a few nights he was mighty scared himself. His little eyes got as big as can be a few times when he's seen a few things uh, happen, and I know he just thought, this is unbelievable, this ain't really happening, is it? But he's seen it. Now, what type of things did he actually witness? <laughs> well, the one that I'll never forget, as long as I live, he was, uh, they, the state troopers uh, just slept on our couch in the living room. So they had alarm clock, alarm clock uh, sitting on the side of the couch, the state trooper was sitting on the couch this one night and the couch was like on the west side of the, in the 
living room, and my dad was sitting in his lazy boy chair on the on like the east side of the living room. And I just was starting to, I was just coming back into the living room from the kitchen area. I seen it first because I was going to go sit like towards the uh, front picture window. We had a chair sitting there. I was going to walk across in the living room and uh, go sit in that chair by the front picture window. And I just happened to look off to my left at the state trooper and I seen this alarm clock literally just started raising, came up off the floor, the carpet, came up about two and a half feet, three feet, started coming right through the living room, and it was coming right at my dad. My dad put his hands up in front of his face like so. Right before it looked like it was going to hit my dad's hands, the alarm clock literally went around, went around the back of his head and went back and landed right where it came from. I think that state trooper had to go put a new pair of underpants on after that happened. He was, he just, I can still see that guy. He just shook his head and his eyes got like so big and it literally scared the crap out of him. I know it did. And he, he just shook his head and he was, actually speechless for he didn't even say nothing right at first and my dad was too he was just more or less in shock too with that happening what other type of things did officers witness that took place oh uh, well those two weeks when the state troopers were there like I said 24 7 uh was one night um well it me and my dad went to the front door because someone was knocking and they wanted to come inside the haunted house. They wanted to, They came all the way from Detroit and said, we went in the haunted house, and we wanted to, We came all this way. So we wanted to see what's going on. My dad said, you know, hit the road or you're going to be going for a ride. Well, I'm not realizing that there was a police officer in our house, you know, and he was hearing all what was being said, and, and, uh, and the state trooper was uh, in the uh, living room sitting on the couch, and his pillow, bed uh, pillow that he slept on, it wet and it hit my ma. The pillow hit my ma in the back of the head and and uh, part of her back. It just like stuck. It was like glued to her. I had two of my cousins were at her house that night, and they were both teenage boys. They tried pulling that pillow off from my ma. Could not even pull the pillow off from my ma. I mean, it was like it was glued to her. It was a magnet right on her, you know. It was just, and my cousins, they were just freaking out. They said, my God, we're using all of our power to try and pull this off that Mabel's head and neck and back area. All of a sudden, about maybe 10 minutes later, it just dropped off from my mom and hit on the carpet, and that was it. So this pillow actually s- stayed stuck to her for 10 minutes. Yep. Honest God. I mean, I put a stack of Bibles on my mom and dad's, dad's grave. I mean, it actually, it really, really, truly happened. I mean, I know a lot of people who would believe that, hearing this now, but it's honest God's truth. You know, that's the one thing from, from my research when it comes to poltergeist activity that a lot of people felt that this was poltergeist activity. Now, we'll get to that in a minute, that the town was pretty much split between what they believed was the cause of the haunting at your home. But, you know, one thing that I have that I have researched when it comes to poltergeist phenomenon is that strange things like this will happen. Uh, needless to say, a, a, a pillow attaching to the, to the back of somebody's head, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Right. It's not suffocating them. It's just... It's just happening. There's really it, no logic behind it. The alarm clock lifting up and going around in a circle and then going back down to the floor right. makes no sense. There's, right. there's no rhyme or reason to what's happening. But that's uh, that's kind of interesting. Now, as far as the way the community felt about the haunting, from what I understand from, from all the interviews I've conducted out in this community, it seemed that the law enforcement didn't really take a stance because they don't, you know, they, they couldn't understand what was happening. 
they were trying to disprove that it could have been paranormal because, well, that's what they do. They're police officers. They're looking for a logical reason that something is taking place. But once it got to the point where they couldn't explain it, they started to look in, in other avenues to try to bring people out there. Right. And uh, that's when uh, Duke University parapsychology team got involved. That's that's right. correct. And they were brought yeah. in by the, the police. Is that the case? Somehow the Detroit Tiger baseball owner at the time, his name was John Fetzer. He was really into this, this stuff. And he somehow heard about our case or what was happening in this house out in Merrill, Michigan. And he was the one that uh, gave Duke University money uh, for two two professors from Duke to come out to investigate our problem in our house. When the first professor came, then uh, the Tiger baseball owner, he would call our house uh, every day to get updates uh, from the professor what was going on and that and I you know I'm still a teenager and I'm really in the baseball and always was the biggest Tiger fan and so it seemed like I always when the phone rang I always answered and it was Mr. Fetzer on the other end of the line and and then you know I thought wow I'm talking to a, a baseball owner you know and I thought that was pretty cool but you know I, we'd talk a little bit about his baseball team and then He'd ask if he could talk to the professor, and then he'd talk to him for a while to see what it was, what he was finding, and what they thought. And but yeah, he was the one that uh, got the professors from Duke out there. Yeah, and he actually financed that. Yeah, that as well. Yeah, I think he donated like fifteen thousand uh, dollars for them to come. What's really interesting is you know you're you were bringing up that. Um, you were wondering about how John Fetzer heard of the story, and I'm willing to bet it was probably this. Of course, you, I'm sure you recognize this quite well. Yeah, when it got in the front page of uh, our our paper, second paper. There was a lot of controversy, from what I understand, behind this, because from from what I understand from all the interviews that I've done and, and from, you know, obviously speaking to you and your brother, is your your family didn't want this to really be out there. Right. You know, and the police didn't either because they were still trying to develop their theories, figure out who suspects could be. Right. They're, they're, they're actively investigating, so they don't want this to become a three-ring circus. Right. Well, somebody goes to the press, and they believe it to be some member of law enforcement. When this happened, and this hit the paper, the front page of the paper, how much did that change things? Well, it... it- it was on a, yeah, it was right on the front page of a Friday paper. And the Sidon County Sheriff's Department said that night, that Friday night, that the corner of Dice and Chapin Road was the busiest corner of all of Sidon County that night. We had just car after car after car after car coming by and sitting out, out front of the house, I mean, all night long. You know, we had the police called that night, too, and they were trying to, you know, clear the people, tell them to get out of the area and that, but it was just unbelievable after it hit the paper. And and people were coming from hundreds of miles oh, away. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like I said, guys that even came from uh, Detroit, as far as Detroit, and they, they said they wanted in the house, that haunted house. They, they weren't going to leave until they got inside because they, they came from that far, and they wanted to see what was going on in that house. Now, I mean, what what kind of stress did that put on you guys? <laughs> you know, and I'm, and I'm assuming obviously much more your parents than you know than you guys. You guys were probably overwhelmed by it, uh, you know, just seeing all this. But your parents seemed that they were pretty reserved and quiet people that wanted their privacy. Right. I mean, we'd uh, we'd walk in the living room and you'd look off to the left side of the living room where we had a window, side window. There would be people, you know out there looking in and same way with the the front we had a real big front picture window we'd have different times there would be five six people all looking through the we did have our drapes closed they'd be looking through the windows trying to see if they could see anything and yeah it, it got ridiculous you know it was to that point i mean they're literally putting their face right in the window. oh yeah yeah so you had absolutely no privacy at this no point. 
Wow. It yeah. was it was it was terrible. And I also in in these reports here, I remember there's a very specific police report that you can match up the date here with the cover of this newspaper where uh they they the police officers that that filed the report made it pretty clear that your father Harold was really upset right, about this story hitting the front page. The guy that wrote the story then, my dad had talked with him a couple of times uh, in the previous two weeks before it got out in the paper. He did not want anything, you know, put in the paper at this time. Maybe if it ever got solved, you know, then then he'd think about it. And maybe uh, he would agree with it. But he's, he just told the guy right out that I do not want nothing until... Hopefully we get this solved, and and I think the police feel the same way. Uh, a week later, it was right on the front page on Friday's paper. And when did you guys realize that this had hit the paper? Where, where was that moment where you guys finally became aware of this? At that time, we were having our signal paper delivered at our house back then. So we just, me and my dad just happened to be going out to Hemlock uh, that afternoon he pulled in the parking lot there, the drugstore in Hemlock, and he said, Terry, go, I'll give you some change. Go run in and get a paper, get the signal paper. So I said, okay. So I went inside, and they still had some signal papers laying there. Just walked in, and off on the left, they had the newspaper rack, and uh, and I grabbed one, and I just couldn't believe what I was looking at. I said, oh, my God, they got the story and the picture of our house right on the front page of the paper so i paid for it walked out and got back in my dad's pickup and i said dad you're not going to believe what's on the front page here today he said what and i showed him and he he i think his blood pressure shot way up he was so mad and then like i say that night oh my god it was just I don't, there was thousands of cars, actually. I mean, literally, I'd say there was probably a good thousand cars came by there that night. I'm going to read some of this, Terry, some of this paper, um, if you know, for, for the people that are listening or, or watching right now, just to get an idea of what, what this story was stating sure. uh, for people. First of all, the headline, Haunted House Remains a Mystery at Merrill. Uh, Merrill's haunted house is still a mystery. After six months, police still do not have an answer. Weird sounds, voices, furniture moving, strong vibrations and explosions from unknown sources, whole house shaking and jumping, cracks in the wall, plaster falling. This has been going on in July for a bewildered family in rural Merrill. State police from Lansing have had special equipment in the house for two and a half weeks, checking the source of the trouble. They were unable to find any success. Before that, to check it all out, police stayed in the house overnight. The power and utility company and telephone company used special equipment to locate the source. Still nothing. So again, just reiterating the fact that they were doing everything in their power. They were bringing out the telephone company. They were bringing out the gas company, the electric company, trying to find what was causing these blasts or explosions that you guys were all witnessing and the police were actually witnessing and nothing. Well, just if I could backtrack just sure. until uh, back when we when it was just always first the knock in the first six months, that was just shortly after the state police got involved in it too then. Uh, when we still were thinking that someone was just coming around every night, they, the state police, brought out a trained uh, German Shepherd dog, and they said, well, if someone comes around tonight, you know, they're not going to get up to this house because this dog's trained, and, and he'll, he'll go after them. Well, they tied him up, had him out by our apple tree, which was right on the east side of the house, and they put the dog out there that night, the first night. After it got dark, same thing happened, and, you know, the knocking started, and we looked out, and we figured, well, that dog would be barking and, like, wanting to tear someone apart, you know? And we looked out, and I looked out first where that dog was, and that dog was just out there sleeping away. And I said, oh, my God. I said, that's when I started thinking, and I said, there can't be nobody out there because, you know, the pounding's on the east side of the house. Hear that dog, you know, unless he's uh, really got bad hearing tonight. 
They said he would have been barking and showing his teeth and whatever, probably to whoever was coming up there or, or tempted to come up there. But he was just out there sleeping away. And the state police, they just couldn't believe that. Also, something else I remember about the case that was to me was really impactful was when they did that stakeout, which, by the way, happened to be Halloween night, right. October 31st, 1974. Yep. When they were doing that stakeout and the pounding started to happen, the captain was getting over the radio and saying, it's happening, it's happening right now. Right. And everybody out there that was surrounding the house, even though they were so close, couldn't hear a thing. Couldn't hear nothing, no. But yet, through the radio, when he was talking through the radio, they could hear the pounding in the house through his radio, which to me is fascinating because yep. you guys are all hearing it. He's hearing it, and that's why he's calling in the squad to to find the SOB doing it. Right. And they're outside and you know, in a rural area, quiet as you know, quiet as can be, ten yards from the house, and there's not a sound. Right. Not a sound. No. That's amazing. Yeah. For anybody that's listening and watching right now, there's so much that we're skipping over because it's impossible to tell this story and absolute chronological detail without really planning it. I mean, we did it the best we could in a haunting on dice road. I mean, this happened people for a whole year. So I mean, over a year, it it would take me hours and hours and hours and hours to tell you guys so much more for anyone that's going to really research the story and, and, and listen to all of Terry's testimony and, and all of the police officers that were involved. Again, watch the documentary, a haunting on dice road, the hell house and these people were all interviewed. Uh, Terry was polygraphed. He's telling the truth, you know, and that's why I am so passionate about this case. And, you know, m- my goal is for it to be a feature film. I want to do another documentary on the subject because at the end of the day, this truly is the most extraordinary paranormal case in U.S. history or even worldwide. You know, and that's what's amazing is you look at all these other you know, cases that are so well known. You got Amityville and and, and the story that The Conjuring was based off of and so many others, and not to take anything away from the gravity of those cases, but realistically, they they do not compare to this. Well, that's why even the one professor, Jerry Soflin, that came out to our house, he even says, you know, he said it to me several times, to you and to a lot of people, that he's been doing this, investigating these paranormal stories for years and years and years and he's been all over the world he to this day still says that our the one on dice road here in merrill michigan was number one as far as he's concerned it happened and it's true and so many people we had probably 30 some police officers that seen and heard things we had so many family members so many friends there was probably a good 70 80 people that over the year that seen and that witnessed and this witnessed phenomenon. things. Yeah. yeah. Sheriff's deputies, state police officers, and, and even tactical divisions of different police officers. You guys had units basically created to, to document what was happening in your house. I mean, that's right. extraordinary, you know, that level of law enforcement and to the point where, you know, cause a lot of people when, you know, when they're, when they saw the documentary haunting on dice road, they're saying, well, how could all these agencies get involved? And the power company, even uh, the electric company, the phone company, and it's because this was really happening. Yeah, they were doing anything to try to figure out something rational. Because when you have very level-headed professional people like police officers and detectives, and of course the state police, they're not going to just chalk it up to being paranormal. That's not going to be their first reaction. And it seemed that they went a long time investigating this before they got to the point where they said. We don't know what the hell this is. Right. They exhausted every tactic known to man. In fact, it's actually in one of the reports that they say something of that nature, that we exhausted all logical, reasonable means of investigation, and they had to put their hands down basically and say, well, there's this parapsychology team out of Duke University. Maybe they can come in and shed some light. This massive amount of law enforcement was involved in first responders and fire departments, which we haven't even got to that part of the story. Right. And the amount of eyewitnesses and the amount of credible eyewitnesses are absolutely extraordinary. Right. You know, I'm not going to sit here and read the entire article, but I'm just kind of skimming this here, this, this front page article. It talks about voices seeming to come out of nowhere and, and voices threatening to to kill the family. 
Can you tell us about that? Well, the first time that happened was there was, I'd say about 12, 15 uh, people in the kitchen dinette area that afternoon, maybe about five police officers and a few of our friends were over and we were just all standing there all together. And all of a sudden we had a, a air conditioner that was uh, uh, in the wall in our dinette. And a real, real deep male voice came through that air conditioner and said that it was going to kill my dad, kill my ma, and kill my brother. And the one captain was there, and he got right on the phone, and he said, I want so-and-so to come out here ASAP, and I want him to just tear that air conditioner apart that there's got to be some type of device or something in there that uh, that uh, made that uh, voice come through that air, air conditioner like that so the guy showed up about an hour later and tore that thing all apart and could not find nothing in there so there was no strange device no, or anything nothing. that could be manipulated nothing nothing so there we go again the police just Lost for words again. They just could figure. They they just didn't know what was going on. Especially now, this voice coming through. That was the first time that we had a voice uh, that came through the house like that. It was just unbelievable. I mean, I can still hear hear it. Really, it was just real deep, real deep voice, a male voice. All right, I'm gonna throw a few more of these at you, and I and I want you to kind of give us. Uh, the full explanation of it. So one of the things it's talking about that uh, there was a professor from a college that, that had gotten involved uh, locally. Now, what, what is that about? He was a professor from Delta college. And at the time he was teaching a witchcraft uh, class at Delta. A, A class about witchcraft. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And the sheriff's department had, got a hold of this guy and to see if, you know, maybe if he could help us out anyway. Well, he, he came up with like 20, 20 different questions to ask. He said, uh, if they knock back with a certain amount of knocks, then there is witchcraft involved. So the professor came up with 20 different questions, and there was a whole bunch of people there that day because knew what uh, we were going to do at that evening. So I'd say there was at least 20 people in the house. We were all together, though. And the professor said that he wanted my dad, Harold, to, to ask the questions. So the very first question was... Uh, that my dad asked what the professor had came up with was if you hate Harold, knock six times. So here everybody's just standing, being real quiet and everything, and just wondering, man, is this going to, they're going to knock back with six knocks or, or what, you know? It was probably about 15 seconds later, Steve, just out of nowhere, there was six knocks. One, two, like six knocks. And just like, I don't know where it really came, where the knocks even came from, really. It seemed more like uh, in the living room area, I thought. But so that was the first question. They answered right back with six knocks. Like, second question was if you hate, Mer- uh, hate Ma- uh, Mabel, my ma, if you hate Mabel, knock like 10 times. And all of a sudden, it was 10 knocks. Then third question was, if you hate Dwayne, my brother, you know, knock like seven times. Sure enough, there's seven knocks. If you hate Terry, you know, knock like two times. And that was the only question that they did not knock back on. All the other remaining 16 questions that were asked, everyone was answered back with a certain amount of knocks what uh, what the professor wanted to uh, have him knock back with. and But the only one that they didn't knock on was me when they, the question was, if you hate Terry, knock 
like two times and it was nothing. Now, who was there to witness this entire thing? There was, like I say, probably that night, there was at least three deputies, a couple captains, I think maybe one state trooper. Wow. There was at least six police officers. So they all witnessed it. They all heard it. Uh, yeah, they all witnessed it. So then the uh, sheriff's department got back with the professor the next next day there at Delta to tell him what happened that night, night before, and and he he just told the sheriff's department right out that yeah, there's as far as he was concerned, there's definitely witchcraft was involved. Something paranormal, something, something supernatural. Yeah. Yep. Wow, that's yep. incredible. I'm going to go back to this article here and see what else I can find, and I'm just going to keep throwing a couple things your way. So we have a we have a deputy here that was quoted. Um, it won't doesn't say his name. They wanted to be anonymous, but it says that I was told to say nothing to nobody about what I heard, said one deputy. I spent two nights there, and I can tell you this. I didn't sleep from the beginning to the end. Doesn't seem too surprising, does it? No. With the amount of things that they witnessed. Right. So it sounds like there's a, according to this article, there was a few deputies that went on the record, but off the record. They chose to to remain anonymous here. Right. Deputies said they've received hundreds of calls from the harried homeowner since the weird happening started in July. Of course, that that's accurate. Um, as you said, every day the police were coming out there, right? Right, every night for the first six months, yeah. You know, one thing that's very interesting that's in here is that they even went as far as to getting the federal aviation uh, people involved because they thought that possibly it could have been radar or something from the nearby airport. Airport, yep, with yeah. Tri-City Airport even. They checked that out even. Yeah, yep. and once again, it, there was no nothing right. there. No, no, nothing. <sighs> they thought that could have been the source of the shaking and yep. the cracking and the, the huge pops. and Yep. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. One thing I see in this article, it says insurance representatives handling the claims and damages for the family are also keeping mum on the subject. So basically, they tried to get the insurance company to go on the record or talk about this, but they wouldn't. Uh, now, that that must have been pretty interesting as well, because you guys are, are making claims to the insurance company, rightfully so, because things are happening in your house that's damaging your appliances, the structure of the home. But they're probably looking at it trying to say, well, what the hell's going on here? Yeah, they, they didn't want to even, you know, they didn't even want to cover nothing. You know, the ceiling, the way it was all cracked. And, yeah, they, they seriously were not even going to help us out at all. And it's, that. it seems that if you didn't have such a police presence involved in this case, they probably never would have. I don't think so. I don't think so either. As a matter of fact, Terry, you know, I'll... I'll I'd love to have you check this 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 collection of reports out because, and I won't name the, the company anymore, and I don't think it even exists today, but the insurance company was actually wanting the police to look into this matter because they were, you know, they were feeling that these claims were frivolous, basically, and right. that they were manufactured. Yep. And, of course, they knew that that wasn't the case because they're there, right. even living in the home for a couple of weeks, which, I mean, that, that really just shows the gravity of what you guys were going through, even on a... I don't want to say small scale like that, but I mean, even just the damages in your home, you were fighting with insurance companies to, to help repair the house so it didn't fall in on itself. Right. I mean, yeah. That's just And down the road, you know, when we had the fires, it was the same way. They they weren't even going to cover the, the big fire at all that time. Well, you know what? Since you brought that up, I'm going to put this article down now so I don't get sucked into it. And uh, let's talk about the fires. You know, so, I mean, people have already heard today they're hearing about knocking and pounding, and then that escalates to explosions. And now we're going to talk about fires. So when was the first fire? Give us that whole story. Well, the very first fire was the day that the first professor flew in from... From, uh, from Duke University. Duke, yeah. yeah. And uh, my brother and my mom went to the airport and picked him up. And he got to the house, and it was about a half an hour after he got there. He said to my mom, he said, I think I'm going to take a, a shower real quick, if that's all right. And my mom said, yeah, go ahead. So then he said, then I'm going to start, I want to start interviewing, you know, each family member one by one. He took a shower, and 
he started the interview with my mom first. They were sitting at the kitchen table, and me and my brother and my dad were sitting in the living room watching TV. And all of a sudden, the three of us, we all, well, at the same time, we all said to each other, you smell like smoke or, you know, something burning. So we all got jumped up off our chairs and coach and, and uh, my mind, the professor didn't notice anything at that time yet or didn't smell anything. or So we started looking, and I went into the bathroom. My dad and brother went check both bedrooms out, and I opened up the bathroom door, and the towel that the professor had used to, to dry off with, that towel was completely engulfed in fire, was burning. And I said, oh, my God. So I, I went out in the kitchen, and and uh, I told everybody, I said, I said, uh, Professor's towel is burning in the bathroom. So that was the first fire. And then... The next day, the second day that the professor was there, we had another fire. And again, in the bathroom, a full roll of toilet paper burned up in just a matter of a few seconds. And the state fire marshal guy that came out, he said, this is impossible for that to have done that. He says, like, no way possible that a full roll of toilet paper can burn up the way it did in just a few seconds. Right. And they even tested it yeah. using a chromatography chamber yeah. for any type of accelerant or anything of that sort. So anything volatile. And they concluded, and the report is right here, that there was no substance. There was nothing detected in any way, shape, or form. And what's really mind-blowing is, in this report here, it says that the way that the toilet paper burned was humanly impossible. impossible. Yeah. Exactly. Now that, I mean, that is extraordinary for a fire marshal to put that in a report. Yep. And once again, that just speaks to the gravity of this case, of this situation. And so that was the second fire. Yep. And then there was a, a third and final fire that... That happened about, that happened while well, the second professor from Duke came up exactly one week later after the first professor came up. And that would be William Roll. Yep. Yeah. William. He came up exactly a week later, and his first night there is when we had another fire, and it was a big one, and that started in the uh, in the bathroom too. Um, a cord, uh, it was a tooth electric toothbrush, you know, the cord was plugged in to the circuit, and. It was like that cord had got cut. Uh, there was a pair of scissors laying there. and But it was almost like it was cut, you know, like with them scissors. But they said, no, you know, someone would have, like if I would have tried cutting the wire with it plugged in, it would have gotten a good old shock for one thing. <laughs> I would have felt it. And, uh, but nothing, they said they could come up with anything that started the big fire that week later in the bathroom either. And that's when, uh, we had a lot of smoke damage while well, the bathroom was completely gutted and the rest of the house had a lot of smoke and water damage. But then it was back with the insurance company again. They did not want to cover the, the claim for the fire. We fought that for a while, and they finally agreed to to take care of it then. But we were living out of the house then for about four months. And that's you know that's the thing, Terry, is that you know with this with this podcast right now, there's no possible way that we could do this story justice. You know, it would take uh, 15, 20 podcasts for us to even try right. to explain. You know, and and what's really um, just absolutely wild to me is that the things we've talked about today are, are huge. You know, I mean, they're, these are traumatic and, and massive experiences. 
uh, explosions and fires and multiple police agencies, and f- you know, fire departments, spontaneous combustion, parapsychologists from Duke University, and even Lund University, Switzerland, a gentleman got involved at one point. Uh, there's so much to the story, you know, and the fact that, uh, and again, you know, people won't, if they haven't seen a haunting on Dice Road, they won't have the context right now, but even your brother almost dying at one point is involved. And as far as, you know, your beliefs about the neighbor, the new people that moved in. Right. Let me ask you this. I mean, we know that the conclusion of the parapsychology team from Duke University, they believed it to be paranormal. They believed it to be poltergeist phenomenon, uh, one of the most extreme cases they've ever seen. Now, the majority of the people in the town believed it to be witchcraft, black magic, occult activity. What do you believe? Well, I I really, to this day, I think that there was witchcraft, still some witchcraft involved in it too. In order for us to really tell this story, we have a lot of work left to do, you know. And, and I've always told you that I'm gonna I'm gonna do whatever I can do to help get this story out there as much as possible because you know, to me, without a doubt, it, it really is the greatest paranormal story never told so to speak, uh, on a, on a mainstream level. Needless to say, you know, it's, it's gotta be very difficult, uh, what you guys went through, you know, and the toll that, that it took on you, your brother, uh, and especially your parents, you know, at that, at that point in their life. And, right. um, and we go really deep into that, uh, with the film, a haunting on dice road, you know? So if people that are watching or listening now haven't seen it, you know, please do so a haunting on dice road, the hell house, we do tell the complete story, and in, even then, there's a lot that never got told. Right. All right. Well, Terry, thank you so much. You know, for for coming in today, and oh, you're welcome, and sharing more about your story, and you know, and I think for people that that have seen a haunting on Dice Road, uh, the documentary, we we did cover some things today. I, I think that they didn't know, uh, such as you know, John Fetzer, owner of the Detroit Tigers, actually funding and financing a parapsychology team from Duke University right. to come out and study the phenomenon. But yep. a lot more to be told, a lot more to be revealed. Right. That's for sure. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much, Terry. Oh, thank you.